And hello, morning, and welcome to uh, everybody at the running community um, for this this question and answer session um, all around running injury. So, first of all, whilst we let everybody uh, join, what I wanted to do is just really briefly introduce myself and, and who I am. Um, so, my name's John. I'm the head therapist at John W Sports Injury, and I'm a sports injury therapist. Um, and I've been a sports injury therapist now for around 13 years when I started John W Sports Injury. Um, but probably more importantly than that, um, I'm a runner um, and a keen runner um, and a really um, grateful member to, to be in the, the running community. I think it's uh, fantastic to have the ability to communicate and talk with, with like-minded people um, just, just like myself. So, um, and I think if you're like me, you probably friends and family find it difficult to perhaps understand sometimes just why I'm so enthusiastic about running. I often get told, oh, it's, it's, it's boring, or I don't know how you go out and just do all those miles. But what I love is then to be part of a community where I can see that there's people that think exactly the same as me. So I always say to people, I think running is just as important for my physical health as it is my mental health. And I think currently, um, that's no more important time than that. So um, as we join, um, I just wanted to say thank you to the, to the running community for the great work that they do. Keep that up. Um, and thank you for inviting me today. So before we get going on taking some questions and things, and I've been communicating with you and some of you might sort of already be familiar with me from discussions, um, I've had some questions that I'll look to cover. But I just wanted to cover some of the things maybe that, um, some of the terminology that we might, that we might use. Um, and so, and that's when it comes to injury. We, roughly speaking, have two types of injury. Uh, we have acute injuries and we have overuse injuries. Now, when it comes to running, why I think these sort of discussions are so important is that really there is no more um, sort of, I suppose, dangerous, if you like, sport for overuse injuries than running. So if I'm working with someone like a skier, for example, the injuries that we see there tend to be acute injuries. So acute injuries are injuries that happen instantly and we get that we get that pain. So you might be walking on the road and you trip down a curb and you sprain your ankle. You may have done that out on a run. But when we have the other end of the spectrum, our overuse injuries, these are where we're doing perhaps something slightly wrong for an extended period of time. And that then causes injury. Now, when it comes to running, and particularly long distance running, if we are doing these small biomechanical things wrong, or we have these anatomical problems, running will find those injuries and will develop those injuries. So whether you have injury, or even if you haven't got injury at the moment, I just think it's so vital to understand some of the things that we're going to talk about when it comes to long distance running um, so we can pre be preventing those overuse injuries. So thank you to the guys coming in and saying good morning to me, uh, Jonathan, Alan, um, and Jennifer and stuff. So what we'll look to do is, is take some of these questions now for you. Uh, we plan on this being about half an hour or so, but we'll, we'll see how this goes. A reminder, and I've put it in the link, we have plenty of free resources available to you guys. Um, so if you if you want to go over to that page you'll be able to uh, be emailed all of our free resources and videos and ebooks and things that we've put together um, so if you miss anything or, or, or think i've scooted over anything too quickly um, feel free to check that out and in the comments at the end i'll put some of the videos as well depending on some of the things that we discussed today um, so i've got a question here around groin and, and hip in times um, that can make it difficult to walk and things so hips and general and, and the groin are related to hip now the hip is very very common problem to to having running and if we don't get our pain in our hip it's also very common that the hip can be the cause of other areas so something i'll come back to talk about a little bit more is where we get our sight of our pain so commonly isn't actually the cause of the pain and what we want to be doing is yes getting rid of pain but most importantly treating the cause so when it comes to hips now we rely on our hips heavily in running um, particularly the, the glutes um, and what's called your glute med in particular, one of the, or gluteus medius I should say, the muscle that sort of sits on the top of the glutes. And what they do is they help to stabilise our hips when we're running. It's why perhaps at the end of marathons um, you see people where their form's gone and their, their hips are a little bit all over the place because those glute meds have stopped working. So when it comes to hip pain, it's very important that we're assessing First of all, the flexibility that we have at our hip. Now, when it comes to the hip, there's multiple muscles that cross the hip, so it can be quite a complicated joint. Um, but I will be sending over, um, or in those resources, there's some videos of how you can assess the flexibility. But the first thing I would check is that you are establishing all of the muscles around the hip, how flexible they are. So whilst you might get pain in the groin, it could well be, for example, that something like your glutes have become tight. Now, put simply, the glutes, when they're contracting, pull the, pull the hip out and the groin pull the hip in. Now, if the glutes, for example, become tight in that hip, that might open up that hip a little bit and elongate that groin tissue and make it susceptible to injury. So 
What we want to be doing is, yes, treating the groin, um, making sure that it's suitably strong, it's suitably flexible, managing it with things like ice, but also make sure that we're getting to the cause. So if it's, for example, the, the glute being a problem, try and highlight that by some flexibility tests. If you find that the glute, and when it comes to testing, I always think it's important to test both sides. So start with the good side, the uninjured side, because that will give you your normal values. And if you find that you're restricted in any of the muscles that cross the groin, that could well be a cause of the pain. So with any injury, say things like ice and strengthening will help, but make sure you're taking a global approach and checking all of the muscles um, that may be affecting things. That one's helpful. So just reading some other questions. Um, and, and shoes and things I know is, a, is, a, is another thing that we get asked about a lot. So I'll briefly mention shoes because um, I'm sure it will come up because when I'm working with any runner, it's, it's, it's one of the things that we of course talk about. Now I should say at this point that I'm not a running shoe expert and I would always recommend um, going to a, a, local, a local running store and finding a specialist running store where they will really know their stuff and be able to analyze you. But having said that, one of the biggest game changers for me in running was getting the correct shoes. So. Um, one, getting the correct shoes, and two, keeping current with your shoes. If you have been using them for multiple times and multiple miles, if we're moving well beyond 500 miles, it might be a time to review those shoes. So that's important for, for all injuries. Um, just moving on to a question here about Achilles tendonitis. Um, so Achilles tendonitis is a very, very common issue with running. And what I'm going to do around this question is couple that into calf strains as well. Now, whenever we get a tendon injury, now, just to be clear for people, what a tendon is, is it's where a muscle, um, it's the structure, sorry, that joins a muscle to the bone. So in the case of the Achilles tendonitis that we're probably all familiar with in the back of our heel, this is the tendon that is joining our calf complex. Now, the calf complex has two major muscles in it, what we term the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscle. And so they both attach to the heel via the tendon. So again, this is one of those classic things where we need to be checking the cause as well as the effect. So in terms of managing the tendonitis, there's a few things that we could do. We can be icing, first of all, making sure footwear is appropriate. Even if we have appropriate footwear, things like heel raises, and um, the sort of gel cups that you can put into the back of the shoes, they can be very helpful just to take some of that pressure away from the area. Um, it also helps you into a process called dorsiflexion. Now, dorsiflexion is the, the amount of movement that we have our knee over our ankle. And for me, it's possibly the most important movement that we can have as runners, because when we run, we're required to dorsiflex. And if we lose this dorsiflexion, the ability to drive the knee over the toe, that can then send problems further up because we'll need to create that dorsiflexion from other areas that perhaps aren't designed to, to be doing that. So in the case of Achilles tendonitis, first thing that we want to be doing is assessing the amount of movement over the ankle. Now we can do this by a couple of tests and I'll put a video in the comments where um, I've put together a video of how to assess your own flexibility. Um, and with that being said, what you want to be doing is assessing both sides. And where you have the injured Achilles tendonitis, if you find there's a restriction in flexibility, that's the first place that you want to start, is to make sure that you're addressing that with some appropriate stretches. And again, I would, um, I, I have a video available to that that can be sent to you about some of the stretches. I think there's also some fantastic, um, information and resources that the running community are putting out. Um, I know Good Stretch have been um, doing some great stretching and mobility work that I've been doing. So I think during these times, it's really important to be doing those extra things as well. Um, and again, once we get the flexibility correct, one of the next things that we can look or at the same time look to address is around rolling the tissue. Um, now, this is a real big topic. And again, there's a video that I can send to you guys around my thoughts on rolling. Um, foam rollers can work really well. I also am a huge fan of lacrosse balls or, or any sort of ball that has some density. When it comes to rolling, what I see is that a lot of the time people do it, but perhaps not with a clear purpose or understanding of what they're looking to do. Like whenever we go out for a run, I think it's important to have to have a target, to have an objective. Now, when it comes to rolling, what we're looking to do is to release tight tissue. And I won't talk about it too much because I talk about it more in the video, but um, 
we use a method or I, I promote a method called the pin and stretch method where what you're looking to do is find those sore points. So in the case of the Achilles tendonitis, what you want to be doing is having a look all around that calf complex because what you'll probably find is whilst the pain might be in the Achilles or around the heel area that you'll have some soreness up into that calf. So once you find a sore area, and again, as I always say, healthy tissue doesn't hurt. So if you're pushing into an area that's sore, that's an area that you want to address. What you want to be doing is really then using a foam roller or a ball to be applying pressure to that area to try and relax the tissue. And what we do is we pin that with the ball, so apply pressure of the muscle down into the ball, hold that for about 30 seconds, and you should feel the tissue relax a little bit, and then look to stretch that tissue over the top for the best and maximum effects from your, your myofascial release. So with the Achilles tendon or calf strains, assess the flexibility, roll out any tight um, areas, and then what you want to be doing is looking to build the strength back. Um, and there's multiple exercises that you can do, um, but one simple one might be single leg calf raises. And we use this a lot because what we can do is compare left to right. So if you find that you look to do 12 single leg calf raises and on the problematic side you're fatiguing more than you are on the good side, you know that there's a strength imbalance there and one to address. So. Um, stretching, assess the air, sorry, flexibility testing, assess the areas, then factor in stretching, rolling, and then build the strength work whilst making sure that you've got the correct footwear. One final thing, and really, I appreciate I'm talking a lot around this question, but it applies to really all of our injuries, so it might save me saving it in future questions, um, is to have a think about the surfaces that you're running on. If you're running a lot on concrete, for example, Try and move where you can onto grass or softer surfaces that might be a little bit more forgiving and create less impact force. The other thing to also consider is the volume that you're running. At the moment, with current circumstances, we might find that we're running much more frequently. Now, whilst I'm a keen promoter of running and, and want you to be, to be doing that, it might be worth having a consideration to some of the other aspects that can benefit your running. So if you are running five times a week, it might be that you reduce that to two or three, but factor in some mobility or some strength or some core stability work, which is so important to also improve your running. I'm completely guilty, as I'm sure many of you are watching this today, of just being um, consumed with running and wanting to get out and wanting to run as frequently as possible. Um, but actually, where I fall down is not doing some of the other things. Some of the things that we're seeing in the videos um, from, from Good Stretch and Burroughs PT and some of the videos I've been following that are, are helping us with the other aspects that are so important to the running. So just think about the volume that we're doing as well. Don't reduce exercise. I'm not telling you by any means to sit around and, uh, and just put your feet up, but, but do some of the other things that might be more forgiving and more beneficial to the Achilles as well. You know, I just scroll through some of these questions. Okay. Okay, so seeing an, another one about hip and groin um, and noticing it when you get up off the sofa or when you twist. Now, that's an interesting point because a lot of times people come to me with groin pains, and this could well be a, be a groin pain, but the other area to address uh, or to consider here is the hip flexors. So a lot of time people walk into clinic when they first see me and say that they've got a groin strain. Now what we actually find is that they've got a hip flexor issue. Now the hip flexors are the muscles that sit, they're almost a deep stomach muscle and they cross the hip and then they lift the hip. So as runners, we are constantly doing, so if I show you, they are creating this movement and that's my hip flexors in here, amongst other muscles, but predominantly my hip flexors creating that movement. So one thing I would say is that when we're sitting, we're contracting those hip flexors. So if we're getting a problem when we get up from sitting, it might be um, that we've got a hip flexor issue rather than a groin issue. They're very, very closely related. But I often see people who have become frustrated by saying that they've been trying to treat their groin and address their groin, but they can't get rid of this pain. And then as soon as we establish that it's a hip flexor issue, that's where they get their, their, um, their sort of biggest gains. And the hip flexors, in my opinion, are very forgotten muscle. Um, Typically, if you stop the average person in the street and ask them to stretch their calf or stretch their hamstring, they may be able to provide an offering or, or something they could do. If you ask people to stretch their hip flexors, I think that would be a, um, much less known. So it's an important area to focus on. One of the other things which I'm sure there'll be questions about is lower back pain. Now, multiple things that can lead to lower back pain, but the hip flexors actually attach onto the lumbar vertebrae. So again, if we're running a lot and using those hip flexors a lot, and they're either too tight, or also what we commonly see is too weak, then actually they can cause quite a lot of lower back pain. So 
Yeah, so it might be that that's worth it, focusing your attention on as well, as well as having a global look around that hip to see the problem, because the poor groin might be getting beaten up by other areas. Um, the glutes in particular, I tend to describe as the big bullies, because they're our most powerful muscle in the body, but they can create a lot of problems elsewhere, so tend to pick on other structures. So that would be something I would encourage you to have a look at. Great question here, actually, um, from Nora here. When I get asked a lot, is it bad for your knees to run on concrete? Um, it's, it's, again, people in clinic, people who come in and see me and think I'm strange when they know how much running I do, say, well, but you're a sports injury therapist and you, and you run, isn't it bad for your knees? Um, what I would say is there's completely conflicting research out there. I think we all know that, that we've all heard that running is bad for our knees and it's going to cause us problems. Now, for us runners and us running community, what is what is hopeful, what I find promising is something I share quite a lot to, to our um, uh, sort of page is that there's actually quite a lot of research showing that that running can actually be very good for your knees and can prevent conditions such as osteoarthritis. However, what I would say, as with any research, there's always going to be fours and against. But I think there's a big caveat to that is that if we're doing things biomechanically correctly, I can get on side with that. Now, what I mean by that is if, for example, we have very poor hip strength or we have very tight muscle structures and a lack of mobility. Yes, I think running anyway on any service will cause problems at the knee. Now, again, when it comes to the knee, I always think the knee gets a little bit of bad press, really. Um, and, you know, got dodgy knees is a phrase that we typically hear. But actually, I think it's really important to remember that the knee just sits in the middle of the leg. And actually, the, the problems I tend to find are the joints above and below it. So the hip joint and the ankle joint that just bully that knee in the middle. So is it bad for the knees? It could be. But that's if, if we're actually doing everything correct and making sure that we've got the correct amount of dorsiflexion at the ankle or the correct amount of strength at the ankle, that our stability that we can have, and we've got the maximum amount of hip stability and strength and flexibility, then actually a lot of the research is, is saying that running can be good for your knees. Also, to pick up on the point about concrete, yes, I think the harder the surface we run on, the more the impact that force is created back up off of the ground that has to be absorbed by our body. And we have structures to do this. Um, so we have things like cartilage, which are shock absorbers. So the body is designed to be able to absorb shock, but of course we want to minimise that. And when it comes to running, and particularly running long distances, we're, we're out and we're repeating this motion. And that's why when it comes to running, we develop these overuse injuries or conditions that we really only see with perhaps um, sports where we're just doing the same thing over and over again. So runner's knee is a condition which is where we suffer pain in the outside. And again, something I'm all at the outside of the knee, sorry. Something that I'm always talking about in the group with people is the ITB or the iliotibial band. Now, this is the structure that runs down the outside of the leg um, and it pulls on the outside of the knee. Um, and what we, we only, we call this runner's knee because really in clinic, we only see these issues related to running. I don't tend to get footballers or um, rugby players or tennis players coming in who get this injury. But what because what we're doing with running is we're doing the same repetitive motion over and over again, thousands and thousands of times. So what it does is it develops these overuse conditions. So what we want to be doing is running on the surfaces that are kindest to us. So that would be grass or softer structures. So where possible, try and factor that in. Times of year, that's easier than others. Um, but yeah, I, it's a good question. So think about the surfaces that you're running on and try and make sure that you're um, making sure that, you know, that the knees are getting their best chance. Um, but overall, there is a lot of positive research out there that us as runners aren't all going to be ending up with uh, serious knee issues. Let's go through the questions. Okay, so just seeing the question here about feet and pain on the outside of the foot, which again is, is something very, very common. Um, there can be a few conditions around the foot. One of the common ones um, is a condition called plantar fasciitis. And in the resources that I mentioned, um, and I'll put the video in the comments, we, we have a video about the most common running injuries that we see in clinic. And, and fasciitis is, is one of them. Now, it might be that the pain is something different. We also have things like extensor tendonitis. But a lot of the times, the, the ways we're treating these things are the same. And that is really establishing the cause. So if we're getting pain in the outside of the foot, some of the Achilles tendonitis points that I made earlier would be things that I would want to look at. So how much flexibility have you got at the ankle? How much strength have you got the at the ankle? What is making those structures work harder than perhaps they should be? 
Um, so, for example, when it comes to a lot of these things, the other thing I haven't mentioned is a process called proprioception. And put simply, this is our balance. So one of the other things that you might like to test is standing on one leg, close your eyes, and just see if you can maintain that balance. And do that on both sides. If you have any issues when you go onto a weak, uh, onto a injured side, you know that the this proprioception process isn't happening as well as it should. And really that's being controlled by the ligaments um, and some of the structures around the feet. So if you find that you're wobbly or, 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 or struggling to balance, you know that those structures aren't strong enough to do that process. And if they're not strong enough to do that process, something else has to do those. And that's where you might be getting these muscles overworking and creating these overuse conditions, such as plantar fasciitis or tendonitis. Now, what plantar fasciitis is, because it may be that we've all kind of suffered this at some stage, I know I certainly have, is it, the plantar fascia is the layer underneath the foot. Um, and this is, this is a, a band of tissue. Uh, we have fascia around all of our muscles. So I often describe muscles as a, as a bit like an onion um, in the sense that we have the, the, the bulk and then we have the skin and then in between there's that kind of plasticky layer. And that's how our, a bit how our muscles are in a, in a very simplistic view. Um, but that plasticky layer is what's called fascia. Now we have parts of this that are thicker than others. One being the ITB or the iliotibial band, which as I mentioned runs down the outside of the leg, and the other being the plantar fascia on the bottom of the foot. So it's no surprise that us as long distance runners, for the reasons I've said, suffer these, these conditions quite, quite a lot. So, but the thing with fascia, the thing to understand is, again, I often describe it as a little bit of a dumb structure, and I don't mean that offensively to fascia, it's just that muscles are incredibly intelligent. We have these properties and these receptors in them, and we can stretch them, and we can increase their flexibility, and they're constantly speaking to our brain, but fascia just kind of gets picked on. So, when it comes to the iliotibial band, or the plantar fascia, you'll hear a lot of people saying, well, you can't roll those structures, or you can't change the flexibility of them, which to a certain extent is true. But what you are doing is you're addressing the areas or the muscle structures around them that could be impacting upon that, that, that uh, fascia. So when it comes to plantar fascia, something that just proves to work really well is to grab something like a hockey ball, a cricket ball. Um, again, clients have said to me things like deodorant cans they've tried. Um, a frozen water bottle can work quite nicely. And just roll into the bottom of that foot. And you'll find those tight structures that you can help to break up. But again, this is just treating the effect. So it's a bit like trying to fix a leak. Um, this is how I often talk about injury, is that we can, if you get a leak in your house, you can plug that leak and it will stop for a little bit. So if we just treat the effect when it comes to injury, you know, we might even get back to running. But once that rain starts again, it will find its way through and the leak will come back. And that's the same with injury. If we're not treating the cause, once we get back to running, you might get away with it for a run or two, but it will catch up with you and you'll get that pain coming back. So you want to be thinking through what we call the kinetic chain. So if you're getting pain in your foot, you want to be thinking what structures could be affecting that foot. And typically it's things like the calf or the soleus. You have another muscle in there called your tibialis posterior. So just seeing the amount of flexibility or movement you have at the ankle will be really helpful for that as well. So um, yeah, so check the balance, check the flexibility at the ankle. And then in terms of treating the effect, things like uh, rolling a ball into the area will be really helpful. And also, once again, make sure that the footwear is correct. Um, uh, just looking at things, question here around ankles again, uh, but what's really interesting, they've asked about supports and things, which is a great question, because again, people get kind of ask me about that. Um, when it comes to supports, um, I feel that supports have their place, um, but again, what I really never want clients to do is become reliant on them. So what a support is doing is really acting, uh, taking on the roles of some of the other structures that we might be looking to, to rest or, or prevent. So in this case, um, it's somebody who had a, a fractured ankle um, and um, just having a look, so just reading this question, about, about wearing the support during the day. So post-op and post-surgeries and things, that's, um, or, or post-fractures, supports have their place in the early stages. So if we are getting inflammation and swelling as a result of things, we know that structures perhaps aren't strong enough to be doing what they should be doing. And as a result, they're becoming damaged, injured, and, and we're getting that swelling. So what I would say is if something is swelling, then 
perhaps it, it is good to use the support, but the key thing when it comes to the support is don't be reliant on those. So use the support for a period of time, but try and phase it out. So rather than using it all day, use it for periods of the day or day or times when you know you're going to be on that ankle or moving around. But as soon as you can get that support off, try and increase the amount of time that you can have the support off. But judge its effectiveness by how's the swelling going? Are you reducing the amount of swelling? Um, Again, whenever you're doing rehab exercises, don't wear the support because that's where we really want to be targeting the structures that are perhaps underperforming. And we want to know that feedback. If something's swelling or something's hurting, we want to know and we want to adjust the exercises accordingly. So, yeah, supports have their place, but certainly don't become reliant on them. Don't be afraid to use them um, if you have swelling and things. That's telling us that there's something quite not working right. But constantly be monitoring the amount of swelling and seeing if you can improve on that. When it comes to swelling as well, guys, don't be afraid by swelling. You know, particularly ankles and things can particularly swell because any swelling in any area, gravity can pull it down so it collects around the ankle. But a reminder that swelling is actually a, a visual sign for us that our body is doing what we want it to do. Our body is reacting and sending the substances that it needs to help with the healing process. So it's not a bad thing as we may think sometimes when it comes to swelling. Um, so a question here about ITB and rolling around the knee pain. So um, real kind of good one. So again, and these, these points made by, by Mark are, are, are really good. So rolling your IT band is, is not the answer, which is true because there's lots of studies that have tried to actually change the flexibility or the length of the, of the um, IT band. And it's actually, it's, it's quite interesting. Have a Google um, of the IT band. There's some great images and you just see how thicker structure it is and you realize that actually we're not going to be able to change that but by all means what you don't want to be doing is not rolling because what you want to be doing is rolling out the surrounding tissues now the itb has two muscles in particular that attach into it the glutes and what's called your tfl um it's not transport for london sorry when they always get our tensor fascia latte, which is again another forgotten muscle but we use it a lot in running because it assists with hip flexion so it's a vertical muscle to the ITB. So when it comes to rolling, they are some of the key areas to be targeting. Um, so you've got the TFL, the glutes, and but also the outside thigh and the outside hamstring. Because what tends to happen is that those muscles can become tight and almost kind of glue up the into the ITB and it all becomes quite bound together, the, the sort of fascia and stuff around it. So what we want to be trying to do is relax those surrounding muscles and almost separate them from the ITB so that the ITB doesn't have that excessive force on it. Um, so yeah, again, I've got a video about rolling and things and the, particularly the pin and stretch method that we use. And that talks about how to use a roller and stuff around those quads. But the key areas to be targeted for outside of the knee pain, which in truth, as I always say, you know, if, you, if you're if you a marathon runner, for example, a half marathon runner, and you haven't suffered some sort of outside the knee pain, you're probably doing pretty well, better than me, certainly, because I have had this. Um, it's it's almost considered an occupational hazard of running. But it definitely, it, again, it's something that we don't have to stand for or don't have to put up with. It's shown us that there's a biomechanical flaw. So along with the rolling, make sure that the flexibility of the hip and the strength of the hip is exactly where it needs to be. Okay. Um, shin pain. So again, what we're seeing here is, is is a lot of questions around these sort of below knee pain, which is exactly right. Now, now shin pain, um, you, you're probably familiar with the term shin splints. Um, us as sort of therapists don't necessarily love that term because it sort of implies that we're sort of breaking bone and stuff, which actually isn't happening. But what is happening is that our bone has muscles that attach into it. So when we talk about the shins or the tibia, um, and we have a layer on, on the outside of bone called your periosteum. And now what happens is the muscles in the lower leg that attach into that bone, they can cause quite a lot of um, disturbance and they can disturb this periosteum. And as we know, I mean, um, even if I think of my, my son uh, who turns five tomorrow, he uh, he's always got those little kind of bruises on his shins. And I'm sure we can always imagine people with bruises up their shins because it's a very superficial structure that, that bruises very easily. So when it comes to shin splints, um, what we want to be doing again is addressing those muscles. So particularly around the calf, you have a muscle in the front of your leg called your tibialis anterior. Now, the frustrating thing about that is it's often termed an unstretchable. Um, it's one of our flaws in our design, really. What the, what the muscle does is it pulls the foot up. Now, in order to stretch that, we need to pull the foot down. But the ankle joint doesn't actually allow our foot to go far enough to get a great stretch. There are stretches that you can do for the tibialis anterior, 
But for me, in terms of getting the best bang for our buck when it comes to these sort of shin splints, is getting in and rolling that tissue or running your thumb along the side of your tibia, both inside and outside. And you'll probably find, you might find some bumps or certainly some sore points. And so trying to do this self myofascial release with your thumb or again, lying onto something like a lacrosse ball to break up that tissue would be really helpful. Another thing that I often recommend about chins is just taking something like an ice cube and just rubbing that up and down the shin and letting that ice cube melt. And it's almost just doing an ice massage, but that'll be calming that inflammation. When it comes to shin splints, there's a few sort of causes about this that we tend to typically see. And it might be, for example, that somebody's changed the amount of training load that they're doing, that they changed the surface that they're training on, um, or a, a biomechanical floor. So just think about those three things. If we're new to running or we suddenly up the distances, it's quite common that, um, to suffer shin splints. So do all those things that I mentioned, but also our body will, to a certain extent, adjust to that. Secondly, um, what we want to make sure is that we've not changed the training surface, or if we want to change the training surface, change it for a kinder one. So as I mentioned earlier, things like grass and stuff might be nicer to run on. Um, and finally, when it comes to shin splints, same as you'll see a real pattern here, is that we want to be addressing the amount of movement that we've got over the ankle and that we're not too tight through that ankle. Because if we've got a restriction in this dorsiflexion, that will be causing a big problem running up through that shin and those muscles will be absorbing some of that impact force um, and some and, and really be over tightening as a result and pulling on that shin. You can see why I really feel strongly about the amount of dorsiflexion flexion we have at the ankle for runners yeah so you guys just trying to fly through questions do, 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 do. right knee pain yeah right this is a good question um because it's a common one i think right knee pain above the knee and it's sore to straighten now again what i should say is it's very difficult to to be die and i and i couldn't diagnose an injury without a full assessment but what this sounds like to me is something that we would term patella tendonitis um which i believe in america is what they actually call runner's knee we call it jumper's knee but the reason is for every runner that I see with runner's knee, pain on the outside of the knee, I see just as many with pain just above the knee running over the top of the knee. Um, and it's, it's what we call patella tendonitis. Now the patella, remember when I spoke about Achilles tendonitis, when it comes to tendonitis injuries, what we want to be knowing is what muscle are they attaching to bone? And in the case of the patella tendon, it's the quad muscles. So what typically happens, I'm sure we've all suffered some sore quads and stuff and might have been going a particularly long run where it's then difficult to walk up or in particularly down the stairs um, because we use our quads a lot. Our body can move in a few different directions. We can move in a straight line front to back. We can move side to side and we can rotate. Now running is very much front to back. We run in a straight line with very little change in directions compared to other sports. So we very much use these muscles that create straight line movement and the quads are a big one of those. So what can happen is they can become tight, they can develop trigger points, which will then be pulling excessively on that patella tendon. And where we typically, if this is the sort of kneecap, and remember I say the kneecap rather than the knee, because the kneecap or the patella is just a, almost a floating bone that sits above the knee joint, okay? And what we've got is a tendon that runs over the top that has the big quad muscles attaching to it. So if these get pulled excessively, the tendon can become very sore and almost rub on that kneecap. And we tend to experience the pain either just above or just below the kneecap. But again, think about the leak analogy or the treating the cause and the effect. Trace that back up, further up the chain and have a look. Check out the quad tissue, see if we can release that tissue with the rolling techniques that we that we talk about and I put a video about. Make sure that your flexibility is correct. Um, and again, in the video you'll see, but a common way I say about this is to lie on your front, do something called Eli's test, which is that you should then be able to pull your heel up to touch your bottom. If you find that difficult, you know you're a little bit tight. But again, it might not just be that. A lot of runners that I see suddenly have their quads are fine. So we think, oh, that's unusual. They're getting patella tendon pain. Then we have a look at their hamstrings, which is what's called an antagonistic pair. And I'm trying not to get too um, complicated for you. But effectively, the quads and the hamstrings work together and the hamstrings are awfully tight. And so we've got this big muscle imbalance and the poor knees taking a beating. So what you want to do is assess the glute flexibility, quad flexibility, hamstring flexibility to be getting at the cause also be managing the, the tendon pain. Now, when it comes to tendon injuries, exercises that are termed eccentric exercises, um, which is a sort of slowing exercise, a decelerating exercise, are designed to really help um, tendon injuries. So you might have seen in the case of an Achilles tendonitis, 
things like dropping slowly backwards off of a step, that would be an eccentric exercise to develop the tendon. So with quads and things, um, you can do some sort of slow base squat work to build that up. But always when it comes to this, working in your pain-free zone. If you're doing an exercise to strengthen, make sure it's not causing pain. Still do the exercise um, because you might develop that pain-free zone and increase it, but stay in your pain-free zone. Hope that helps answer that one. But very, when it comes to the knee and um, front of knee pain to runner's knee, jumper's knee, they're very interchangeable, very similar. Um, da, 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 da. Again, I've seen a question here about pain behind the kneecap. Um, could well be um, the patella tendonitis. There's another condition called chondromalacia patella, um, which is where the underlining of the of the patella and where we have cartilage gets damaged. Um, and that's very difficult to pick up. But again, when it comes to these, we would treat that in the same way. We want to make sure that the knee is a happy place. So making sure that we've got the flexibility correct and things. Um, yeah, I've seen one here about knee clicking, uh, which is a really good question because um, people often speak to me about that. Um, so when it comes to um, knee clicking, um, sometimes clicking clicking doesn't have to be the big thing that we worry about a lot of the time. A lot of joints click. Uh, clicking can be caused by a few different things. Sometimes it can be air escaping out of the joint, um, what we call cavitation. So you, you might well have watched some of the YouTube videos of chiropractors getting that great click where they release, that's them releasing the joint and the air escaping from it. Um, but another cause of clicking can be some of these soft tissue structures sort of almost sort of snapping over bony um, protuberances. So um, in the case, for example, of the knee, sometimes that patella tendon, which as I mentioned, crosses over the top of the knee, it can just almost create like a clicking or a pop as you walk. Um, also in the joint space, so we have with, with any joint two bones that form a joint and it leaves a space in the middle. If there's any kind of what we might call crepitus, which is um, little bits of rubbish that can collect really in that area and they can make a clicking sound sometimes. But again, I would say it's not anything to necessarily worry about, but it's perhaps just an indicator that something at the knee could do with addressing. So check out that flexibility, check out your strength and try and establish where that's coming from. And again, feel free to ask any more questions on that. Um, I saw a question here about pain at the back of the knee. Um, so that hasn't been suffered before. So again, um, there's Again, multiple things that could be the cause, but one common thing to check out would be your hamstring. So a lot of time people come to me with, with, with pain in the back of the knee, and what we actually find is it's not the knee, but the hamstrings which attach just in the behind of the knee. So if your hamstrings have become tight, um, you've got those sort of two structures on, on the back of your knee that we, particularly you can feel when your knee's bent, often described a bit like guitar strings, you can really feel them, almost like you can flick across them. They're your hamstring tendon. So if the pain is around there, I would say address having a look further up that chain and address in the, um, the hamstrings. If it's not that, there are other structures obviously in the back of the knee that could be investigated, but I would say a very common cause, I'm trying to answer things as generally as possible as I can, for back of the knee pain would be those hamstrings. So again, can you lay flat on your back and lift your leg up to 90 degrees, keeping the knee straight? This will be in that setting your flexibility video, um, would be something that I would, I would check out first. Um, yeah, just seeing here, tibialis tendonitis, took five to six months to recover. Now I do calf strength and exercise every day. Yeah, so I, I dropped in earlier about tibialis posterior, um, which is uh, a very, very common problem in runners. But it will sort of present, uh, again, in the, in the video that, um, again, I'll, I'll link to, which is seven most common injuries that we see in clinic. This is one of them. Where it can present itself is pain around the inside bony bump of the ankle. Um, it's what's called your medial malleolus. And the tendon of this muscle, this tibialis posterior, wraps around the inside um, or wraps around that bone. So you can get some pain around there when you're running. So if you've been feeling pain on the inside of the ankle, it's a good chance it could be that. But again, the tibialis posterior is a muscle that sits on the back of the shin bone. We also have the tibialis anterior, um, which, which sits on the front, um, which is the one I mentioned earlier. But the tibialis posterior is one that's often missed. So runners come in and say, I've had this calf problem, I've had this calf problem, I'm stretching my calves, I've got all my flexibility flexibility back but I just can't get rid of this pain and what we actually do is drop a little bit deeper and get into that tibialis posterior 
Now you can typically find this muscle by placing your, your thumb on the inside of your shin bone and then dropping inside towards your calf and almost trying to move your calf a little bit out of, out of the way and then you might feel another muscle underneath and that's your tibialis posterior. So run your thumb along and down towards the inside of the ankle, that inside the ankle bone, and you might feel pain along there. But they're quite right in what they're saying. They've been doing calf strengthening work, which is great. Make sure you're doing the flexibility work as well. Whenever you're doing strengthening work, for every bit of, essentially what we want is very strong, but very flexible muscles. So what we don't want to do is get them very strong, but very short and tight and not have that mobility. Um, so again, you know, I mentioned earlier, um, the good stretch, um, the Burroughs PT, the mobility stuff, the videos that are out there, coupled with some of the ones that I can put with you, make sure you're doing all those things as well as you're doing the strengthening. What I tend to find in my clinical experience is we get very fixated with strengthening, um, but there's, there's, it is, of course, of course, very important, particularly when it comes to the longer distance running, but we need to make sure we're flexible as well. Um, but da, 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 da. Pain in the outside of the hip, um, so yes, now again, I said at the start about how complicated the hip is, um, very common to suffer pain, um, particularly in the outside of the hip. So it could be a number of things, but again, you might be familiar with a condition called bursitis um, or trochanteric bursitis in particular when it's in the outside of the hip. Now what this is, is where we have these fluid filled um, sacs that separate muscles from bone to stop them, or tendons from bone, stop them rubbing on each other and causing a problem. But if these become inflamed, it can become particularly sore. So what we tend to find if we go out running is that actually we might develop this pain in the outside of the hip. Now it could be the muscle itself becoming tight, things like the TFL or the glutes that I mentioned earlier, or it could feel if it's particularly localized around the outside of the hip and almost around that hip bone that you're suffering a little bit of this bursitis. But again, bursitis is almost what I call a secondary injury where we're getting this problem, but we need to get to the primary problem. So it would come back to making sure that your hip is fully flexible and mobile and strong enough for the demands that you're putting it through. But to manage the pain around the hip and to reduce the inflammation, which is what we want to do for the bursitis, things like ice will, will help with that one. Um, compartment syndrome um, in the shin, as I say, probably a better term uh, for us therapists than shin splints. Is surgery the only option? Um, it's a option, um, but for me, something I always say, it should be the last option. Um, so many times people, we, and again, it will depend on who you speak to. And, you know, if there's any surgeons watching this, they may well argue with me. And I completely understand that. Um, but as a sports injury therapist, I'm always going to put it as my last option. I think what we want to do, and a reminder, if we don't actually correct the problem and we go and have the surgery, it's something I see quite a lot or around surgeries or injections, is that we just have those and it helps for a bit, but we've forgotten why we got there in the first place. So as I said, if we don't correct the cause, it's not going to come back. So... When it comes to the compartment syndrome, you want to be making sure that you've really covered all your bases and that you've got all of the dorsiflexion at the ankle, you're as strong as you can be through those calves, um, and if it's still not going away, then I would get some deeper investigation before turning to surgery. Because even if it ultimately ends up in surgery, the better we go into surgery, the better we come out, and the, lo and the bigger our chances of it not reoccurring. So have it as a last option, certainly not the only option. That one helps. Um, Pain in the ball of my left foot. So pain here in the ball of the left foot. That is very likely. Could be other things, but very likely to be that plantar fasciitis, which I've mentioned about. So um, same sort of principles apply, and it will be in that video that I popped over here. So I'm just trying to make sure I'm covering all questions. So yeah, someone uh, quite rightly asking me about should we concentrate on our biomechanics first? Definitely, uh, biomechanics is so important. Um, you know how we move, particularly running. I mean, we only have to look at the elite runners um, to just see how. Just it's like poetry watching those guys run. They're so biomechanically perfect. Um, some of us are more blessed than others um, when it comes to biomechanics. And unfortunately, if you're less blessed, a bit like me, um, it does leave you more susceptible to injury. Um, so things things like gait analysis, running technique are so, so important. Um, you might find in current times that you're spending more time on a treadmill if you have that. Um, sometimes people refer to these as the dreadmill, which I completely understand. Um, I, I don't enjoy it. You know, the beauty of running for me is getting out there. Um, but if you are on a treadmill, sometimes it can be a time to really think about some of that technique. I won't probably go into running technique and biomechanics is another video in itself. Um, but if, if you're aware of some of the biomechanical things that you'll be working on, using the treadmill and stuff can be a good time to really think about those and try and adopt those into your running. Because it's very difficult to change our running styles. But what I try and encourage people to do 
um, is to perhaps try and focus, if you go out for a three or four mile run, for half a mile, to really try and think about perhaps changing your biomechanics and seeing if you can change that over a period of time. Because what we don't want to do is change it all too quickly because that will cause us problems. But I'm also conscious that I'm not a running coach. Um, uh, yeah, I can certainly hopefully help people with this, but I'm sure there's people um, who, who may be able to help you better than I can when it comes to those sort of biomechanics. So um, my background is in sports science as well as sports therapy, but, um, but yeah, biomechanics is very important. So uh, if you can um, assess and have a look and assess your own gait, that would be a good thing to do. But da, da, da. so outside of the knee pain, again, we've sort of spoken about outside of the knee pain. Um, and someone's made a good point here as well, this outside of the knee pain, not sure if I need to rest. Well, rest certainly has its place. But again, what I would say is, if you are resting, then use that as active rest. Um, so if you do have to rest because running is sore, um, you know, I find that very difficult. Um, my wife would testify that when I can't run, my mood all changes. So I, I very much don't like to rest personally. I'm trying to talk here probably more as a runner than I am as a sports injury therapist to, um, to sort of be on the same wavelength. So I completely understand that resting is difficult. We all want to get out there and run, but it does have its place. In truth, the sort of big injuries I've sustained, I've had to put myself on a running ban, psychologically commit to that in order to get over them. Because there's nothing worse than going out for those runs, and I've, I've done this building up for races, where you're running through pain. And it just takes the enjoyment out of it. And you're really, for every step forward you take, you ultimately take two steps back. So rest has its place. But having said that, use that as active rest. So as I say, there's more to running than just running, or your running can improve by doing other things. So um, not possible, I appreciate at the moment, but things like swimming can be really, really good. There's also things like aqua jogging and stuff where you can um, also apply a flotation device and be running in a pool and things, which is gonna be much more forgiving, allow you to get that running buzz, but might allow the injuries to heal as well. So trying to sort of almost think outside the box, cross training, stretching work, yoga, all those types of things that are gonna ultimately still help your running, but give the injury time to recover. So allow the rest it needs, don't run through pain, or, or even just reduce your miles if you want to get back out there. Um, again, if we are building up things, it's really difficult. When I work with people building up for marathons and things, we're of course obsessed by our programs, and I'm completely in the same boat. But what I would say, was better to be on the start line, fit and things, um, than, I, than, than to be on the start line injured. If you get on that start line, fit and healthy, you've got much more chance of getting to the finish line, in my opinion, than getting on that start line in complete and utter agony um, and trying to get to the finish line. So yeah. But uh, yeah, just taking a couple of questions. Ah, great one here, barefoot running. Pros and cons. Um, yeah, you might well have um, read things about Born, Born to Run, which is a fantastic book that I read a while ago, and it, it really put light to barefoot running. Um, barefoot running, yeah, it's an interesting one here, and, and I think, you know, I, I certainly don't have the view that is correct, this is just an opinion. I think the problem that we've got when it comes to barefoot running is we're now so conditioned by wearing shoes and trainers that it's difficult to do it. Of course, if we could have done it all the time and build up that strength that's required, it would be great. And if you can do it, or wear neutral shoes and things, and, and or, or minimal shoes, and build your own strength and not suffer injury, then I think it's a good thing to do. The, 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 the con to it is that unfortunately now we've had our whole lives and running lives and, and, and overall lives wearing shoes and things that we've kind of become reliant on those and we haven't got the fundamental strength to do barefoot running. So when we then go to it, it can cause those problems and things. Um, so I, I love the concept and I completely agree with why it's beneficial. I just fear for the amount of injury it, it could cause. So what I would ultimately say, if you're looking to do it, I would transition to it slowly and try and just be be working working through and up to that. And it's a cracking book as well, by the way, if that's where that one comes from. Um, conscious of um, the time and things um, keeping you all for too long. Um, uh, yeah, so stress fractures in the shins, um, still a bump and things now. I mean, the pain in the bigger lump was. Any advice? I mean, really it's establishing kind of what is the pain in there. So stress fractures are, are frustrating because ultimately we just have to rest to allow them to heal. But what we want to be doing is making sure then that the pressure being placed on that shin is as minimal as possible. So it comes back to that sort of shin splint complex uh, conversation that we had earlier, looking to release the tissue, anti-inflammatory in it, because that lump and things could be sort of a period of inflammation as well. Um, so, yeah. 
Um, I think I'm kind of nearly at the end of the questions now. So someone's asked me, Paul, here about hip pain. Um, so I think I've mentioned hip pain a couple of times earlier. So in order not to repeat the to the people who are still with us, we're looking at that. And the other thing I would remind you all is there is a page where I can send you all our resources where we discuss some of these things. And I'm more than happy to um, chat to you guys and we can email and talk and whatever's needed to, to help you out. As I say, yes, I'm a sports injury therapist, but I'm also a bit of a, a running geek. So I'm always happy to, to chat about running um, and chat with like-minded people. Um, dull, irritating pain towards the front side of the hip. Um, it's like I want to pull my leg out of its socket well, to reset it into its socket. Yeah, um, I can understand that and I can understand what you're saying. It almost wants to pop back into place. Um, what I would say by that, that could, again, it's, it's a case of first getting into assessing the amount of flexibility all around the hip and at, at sort of ascertaining which areas are tight. Um, what it could well be, again, could be something like that hip flexor. If that hip flexor gets tight at the front, it can, it can almost create like you want to snap that, that tissue where it crosses the hip bone at the front there. You want to almost snap that to get that release and into position. So bear in mind it's a deep stomach muscle as well that's crossing the hip. So that would be one I would, it's difficult to say exactly because there's so many structures, um, but assess the hip flexibility, but have a close look at that. Um, hip flexor and if it's that tendon is it if you feel the front you've got what's called your ASIS or anterior superior X spine like a bony bit at the front of the hip if it's crossing if it's sore as the tendon crosses that it could well be that you want to address that hip flexor and then you want to get it deep into that stomach um, so I think I've kind of covered all the questions gone for longer sorry guys if I've rambled on and things um, gone for longer than, than was planned but um, you know really thrilled by all the questions that you guys have asked as I said, I do have a page um, for runners where you can enter your email address and we'll send you over all our, of our resources. Um, I'll pop some of the videos from our YouTube channel as well um, that might be helpful with some of the content we've discussed because I might go into a little bit more detail for it. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out to me and most importantly, um, stay, stay well, stay healthy, keep running and uh, I'll look forward to catching up with you all soon. Take care.